Our speaker today is uh, Agatha Debril. Did I pronounce it right? Yes, you yes, did. Then. Yeah, then. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Agatha finished her studies in animal medicine in Paris. And to complete her knowledge about animal behavior, she obtained a Master of Science degree in ecophysiology and ethology in Strasbourg, France. During a long-term internship in a zoological institution, she met uh, Pauline Kaiser, uh, the founder of Arcticus Binturong Conservation. They became good friends and started planning an essential scientific in situ program focused on the Binturong. In 2017, they flew to Palawan for the very first time to implement the bear cat study program. Since then, Agatha has been splitting her time between uh, veterinarian clinics and fieldwork in Palawan forests. So everybody, let's all give a big, warm, virtual welcome to Agatha de Bruville. Agatha? Yes, thank you very much, Solante, and thank, thank you, you. Um, to UPLB for inviting me today to present you the Burkhardt Study Program. Um, so as it has been said, uh, I am the, the co-president and scientific officer of the AB Conservation, which is an NGO entirely dedicated to the study of the bear cat, not only in Palawan, but in the whole world. And I will present to you today our work in the Philippines, uh, in Palawan Islands. And uh, I'm just uh, using this little bit of time to tell you that we are present on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. So don't hesitate to follow us if you want to know more about our work and uh, uh, the program in Palawan. So what we are going to see today, uh, I'll go first with a brief introduction uh, to the bear cats about biology, ecology, and also the threats and the conservation programs that um, I then go for a state of heart uh, because it's really important to understand what we know already before going for any study. And I will then, uh, least, last but not least, uh, talk about the, the study program that we are actually conducting in Palawan. Well, let's start with the biology. Very briefly, the bear cat here uh, belongs to the Viveridae family, which is the family of the civets and the genets. Uh, it is actually the biggest civets in the world. Uh, it is an arboreal mammal uh, that is mostly uh, nocturnal and uh, that is omnivorous, but with a large tendency to eat only fruits. As it is a very often, a question that I hear very often, uh, I wanted to take just a few minutes to talk about the musang, uh, also called the common palm civet, a subspecies philippensis in uh, the Philippines, uh, because it's really, really, um, it happens often that people um, mistook musang for, for bintrongs. So we'll go for the differences because it obviously uh, they belongs to the same family. They are both omnivorous also, both arboreal, uh, both nocturnal. So they have a lot of, in, lot of in common, but they are really different animals. Uh, to start with, they have a very uh, different morphology, general morphology. The musang is really smaller. Even if in Palawan, the bear cats are a bit smaller than in the, the mainland, uh, musang are still smaller than bintrongs. They have also smaller uh, legs. The head of the musang is quite thin and quite long with a real mask with uh, dark areas. While the bear cat has a homogeneous head, rounder, a little bit thin also, but a little bit rounder than the, the musang. Uh, the ears are also very different. While the musang have big ears, the bintrongs have 
also round ears uh, like the musang, but very, very small, finally. And what we mistake for ears in the bear cat as are only hair uh, coming behind the ears. I'll show you later. The musang has a spotted fur, while the bear cat has a gray and black. It's a mix uh, of the colors um, with very long hair compared to the hair of the musang. And the tail is very, very different because the tail of the Bintrong is, which is kind of amazing because uh, it's one of the two carnivora uh, with a prehensile tail. It's something that is really rare uh, among the, um, uh, this family. Uh, and it really helps the bear cat to be able to climb really, um, really up in the, in the trees. So let's see that. Um, here, a bear cat. So you can see the head is quite round, very homogeneous, even if it's a mix of black and gray hair. It's really thin and really tiny ears. And what you see behind is not the ears, it's really um, some hair uh, coming out. If you look at the general body, it's quite long with long um, legs. While for the civet, for the common palm civet, you can see the mask here with the areas and the lighter areas. The head is longer and they have spots everywhere. So we're gonna play a little game. I wish we could see each other so you can give me the answer right away. Uh, but I just want to, you to be sure and certain that you will never mistake Musang for Bintrungs anymore. So let's go. I'm going to show you some pictures and I will give you five, five seconds to tell me if it's a Musang or a bear cat. I hope everybody has it right. It's a Musang. You can see the mask here. And you can see also that it's short hairs and big ears also. Musang or bear cat? It's a bear cat. You can see that the tail is really long and muscular, so very um, thick tail and hair, black long hair and tiny ears. So it's a bintrong. Musang or bintrong? Bintrong again, you can see here the ears are really, really small. The head is not that long. And again, the hairs, the hair, the fur is really, really different. And it helps you a lot to, to make the difference between Bintrong and Musang. Now you are becoming experts. You know that this is a Musang. You can see the mask on the head and also the fur is really different. Lighter in Palawan, but, and you cannot see really spot here, but you can see that it's really short, short legs also. And the last one, Musang also, you can see here the mask and the big round ears. Okay, now you know everything about how you can recognize a bear cat. Let's go for the ecology. Cat is so interesting to, to protect. Uh, this is uh, from the IUCN website, the um, geographic range of the bear cat. So you can see it's in whole Southeast Asia, um, mainly places with big forest. And you, it has almost disappeared from Vietnam. It, we suppose that the, it, it shall be uh, a little bit more in China, uh, but it, the bear cat has also almost fully disappeared from China. And here in the Philippines, you have this very specific area because it is found only in Palawan Island. And why the bear cat is so interesting? We talked about it um, earlier. It's an omnivorous animal, but with a big tendency to be frugivorous. Um, some scientists say that they have specific digestive enzymes that will activate germination, and so it's a good seed disperser. Uh, but one question remains, and which is really important, which 
fruits exactly would the bear cat disperse? So now you know that the bear cat is amazing and that we need to protect it because it basically helps the trees to uh, regenerate. Um, let's see why, why the bear cat disappear. Well, one of the biggest actual current threat is the pet market, because in the Indonesia, which is really close by uh, Palawan, uh, it is allowed to have bean trunks uh, in cages at home. Uh, and unfortunately, even if they are farms uh, and ex situ reproduction of the bear cats, some of them are coming from the wild. You have also a little bit of poaching for medicines, especially in Vietnam and China. This is one of the reasons why it has almost fully disappeared from them, for, from there. And they also eat the, the meat of the bear cat. And last but not least, the deforestation. I think you are all aware of that, so I will not, not make any comments. What about the conservation programs uh, on the bear cat? This is coming also from the IUCN. Uh, the bear cat is considered as vulnerable by the IUCN red list with a decreasing tendency uh, for the population, uh, which is something we really have to look after because if it has a decreasing population, it might go for endanger uh, soon. And it is actually uh, considered by as endangered by the Palawan Council for Sustainable Development. So the Palawan bear cat, which might be a subspecies, is already considered as endangered. There are no conservation program aside from what we're doing with the AB conservation. And also one problem that we are facing is that there are very few studies about the bear cats and too few studies. So that's why we go to the state of art. The first studies that have been done on the bear cat were um, ex situ studies, which mean it has been done in um, the, the, the zoological institution, basically. They've learned a lot about the animal medicine, the veterinary medicine. So uh, especially diseases that can be spread from the bear cat to uh, the, the human, which is quite important. They also learned a little bit about the reproduction and the phys physiology, uh, with one point that is quite important for us, uh, as, I, as I told you, uh, we are looking for which fruits the bear cat could be uh, dispersed, um, because it's really important to explain its role in the environment. And so they did some germination trial, especially in this uh, study by Colin and Compost Arcase. Um, and they got really interesting results. I'm sorry because the, um, the quality of the, of the graphic is not that good, but still. Uh, they gave seeds uh, to be eaten by bintrongs in Singapore. Uh, they gave three types of fruits, longan, papaya, and chiku. So in red, you have uh, the percentage of seeds that have been germinate, germinating after being ingested by a bear cat. And in yellow, you have the seeds that they have planted right uh, after getting the fruits, so without any ingestion by any animal. And you can see here that depending on the fruit, impact of the bear cats uh, the, chest, the digestion can be finally quite detrimental for the lung and for example, control group uh, has a better germination rate than the, the seeds that have been swallowed by the bear cats. While for the papaya and the chiku, it has a tendency to be the opposite. Uh, the digestive system of the bear cat would have a, a, quite a good impact which is not that big for the chiku. And actually in this study, the, um, the difference wa was not uh, statistically significant. So this study was a little bit controversial because it 
would show that finally, even if the bear cat is a seed dispersal uh, in terms of taking the seeds quite far from the tree, it will not have such a good impact on the germination of the seeds. But with all those studies, the ex -seeded studies, we really have a problem because it cannot be directly linked to uh, what's happening in the um, in the reality, what's happening in the wide. And sometimes you'll see you have differences because you did lab analysis instead of going to the forest. So this is a map reviewing all the studies that have been citing the bear cat, not only the studies that are directed to the bear cat. And you can see that the, the most information that we get uh, are coming from camera trapping studies. So it's the orange um, signs. And they are not really well um, disseminated among the, the geographic range of the bear cat, especially here in Palawan. You don't have that many um, information on the bear cat. The only other study that could bring quite much information is the radio tracking studies. But you see that you have only three studies that are stating that. And they are both in Thailand and one in Borneo. Um, you can uh, actually not see them because there are too many uh, camera trapping information. So they are behind those. So what about the camera trapping? Well, the main problem with the camera trapping that is um, currently uh, carried out in Southeast Asia, it's that it's ground-based camera trapping. So you put your camera up to 50 centimeters above the ground. Uh, you can be targeting um, trails or um, places you think animals will be. Um, but for the bear cat, it doesn't work that well because the median detection rate of the bear cat is about 0.063%. Um, just to help you understanding what it means, it means that for studies between 600 and 30,000 trap nights, so 30,000 is very, it's a very, very big effort of study in camera trapping studies they obtain between one and 19 pictures. Uh, so it's really, really weak. It's really, really low. And it gives a lot of problem because with a real, that, um, with a low that, with a rate, sorry, that low, you cannot process density. You cannot count how many bear cats are left in the, in the, um, in the wide. You cannot do occupancy. Occupancy is a kind of study that helps you understanding which part of the forest um, are most likely to be habitated by the, the bear cat. So um, you only have the presence information. You don't, you cannot even talk about absence because actually with the, uh, uh, rates that low, if you don't see the bear cats, you don't know if it's just because you haven't got uh, an effort big enough, or if it is because the bear cat is really absent of the, of the area. So you only have the presence if you have a picture and you cannot get anything more uh, from those kind of studies. Well, the only thing, sorry, you can take for, for it, but you have to go to review all of this, uh, which I've done for my vet thesis, is the activity pattern. When you talk all the, um, the pictures, so the 60 observations, you can understand a little bit more how the bear cat is active. And it's quite interesting because I told you first that it is nocturnal, it's what we thought because most of the civets are nocturnal, but you can see that finally uh, here, there they, they are some peaks of activity during the day also. And the activity is not that regular during the night, you have real peaks. 
according to those uh, observations. And the biggest peaks here and here uh, are finally uh, in crepuscular um, timing. So it, it's, it's interesting because it helps you um, building protocols, uh, but it's still really weak uh, for, as information. Uh, I told you then that there are radio tracking uh, studies, uh, only three studies uh, that represent a little bit less than 10 individuals in Thailand and Borneo only, so only two countries. And they had really wide uh, and various data. Uh, the home range, for example, they had information. They get home range from 0 0.98 kilo square kilometers to 6.9 square kilometers. In Thailand, they, show, they, yeah, they showed that the home range was a little bit different in rainy and dry season. And actually, the, the home range from Borneo were really smaller than the one in Thailand. They also studied the daily activity, daily movement. And uh, here again, in the Borneo, uh, Bintrongs uh, had the tendency to have shorter daily movements, like more, mostly from zero to one kilometer, but with a mean, with a mean daily movements around 300 meters per 24 hours. So it's, it's really small movements. In Thailand, it was a little bit more, but it was still mostly around 500 um, meters. Uh, this is, I'm, it might seem not that important, but actually it is when you are planning to do some camera trapping and I'll explain you later why. And one of the most important thing uh, that we are looking for, and you'll see in my whole presentation, I'm I will always talking about the diet because, um, as one of the most important ecological role that the bear can can have is about um, dispersing the seeds and playing a role in the seed germination, uh, the diet is very important. And there were studies, uh, but only two focused on those, uh, Nakaba uh, one from Nakabayashi and one actually from UPLB, uh, from Alam and Fernandez, um, that are of interest in the diet of the bear cats. Uh, they've been done in Borneo and in Palawan. And they showed both of them, they showed the importance of the fig in the, um, the diet of the bear cat. Uh, in the study of Nakabayashi, she showed that 87.5% of the feeding sites of the bear cat that she followed uh, were fig trees. And in the study also of Alamin and Fernandez in Palawan, uh, they've shown that the bear cats was eating mostly fruits, uh, mostly figs, sorry, fruits, but figs especially. Uh, so it would seem that the Bintrungs had a role in a fig tree dispersion. And um, Nakabayashi showed also in her study that finally uh, the germination of the seeds of the fig trees are helped by the digestion of the bear cat. So um, it, it is a little bit uh, in contradiction with what I've seen uh, Colin uh, in her study, but uh, that's also why it is really important to do studies in the wild and not only in uh, the labs. So we're coming to what we are doing, study the bear cat. Why? I hope you and you've understood that we really lack of information uh, on, those spe on these species. Uh, we have a decrease in population uh, that is now vulnerable but endangered in Palawan that might be endangered in the whole uh, area of its ge geographic range. And we still don't know so much about it. We need to determine their needs, uh, what, what 
do they need from the forest to survive? The nesting places, the feeding places, um, even in the, the previous um, image, I, you can see that the bear cat was eating an animal because it's omnivorous. It's mostly frugivorous. I will talk a lot, a lot about um, fruits, but it's also eating animals. So we need to understand how much, what kind of animals to be able to determine their needs, but to also be able to determine their interaction with other species, whether they are detrimental to the other species, to animals, especially, for example, if uh, they are predators of specific animals, but also to the plants. And uh, I've underlined it because I think it's one of the most important thing. We need to understand how bear cats interact with plants, how plants can help the bear cat, giving nesting, giving resting places, but also how the bear cat can help the plants uh, with the seed dispersal um, uh, effects. Where? Well, if you put those two maps together that you've already seen, you can see that there are places where um, this species has been very few studied. You have a lot of things in Borneo, you have a lot of things in Thailand, you have not that much in Palawan. So that is one of the reasons why we choose to come here to the Philippines in 2017. And then how? Well, I showed you that the camera trapping was not that interesting uh, for the bear cats because it was not adapted to the species. Uh, and that's actually why I put those two pictures together. The bear cat climbing the trees and us climbing the trees, because it is one of uh, the major goal of our studies. Um, we really wanted to mimic the bear cats to try to get the most of the information. So for the camera trapping, we had to adapt the method. Ground-based camera trapping was really not efficient for the bear cats. So we decided to go up. We decided to put the cameras in the trees, in the treetops, exactly. And this helped us to target ecological goals and have more than just presence information about the, um, the bear cats. And then we wanted to go forward with radio tracking because we really feel that is, it is one of the best methods to have more information of the bear cats information on the behavior, but it also helps to study the feces of the bear cats because it's really complicated when it gets uh, to understand the diet to only do behavioral observation. The feces is actually what you, well, the best sample to understand exactly uh, what the, the animal eats. And we wanted to be sure to study bear cat feces. And to be sure we, we study bear cat feces, the best way is to follow bear cat and get the scat when it's done. So um, radio tracking is one of the methods that can help you uh, doing that. So let's go for arboreal camera trapping. Well, uh, we didn't invent the concept of arboreal camera trapping. It has been done before by different um, research teams. So there are some general guidelines, even if it's still um, really underestimated and it, it's still a, a study a method that is not really uh, often used. So first, and it's really important, we always say it on field, safety first. You cannot target to do arboreal camel trapping. You cannot want to do arboreal camel trapping without having a, a good tree climbing training. I know that Filipinos are really, really good at climbing trees. Um, but even you really need the material. You go really high in the trees. You go up to 20 meter high. So you need to secure yourself and to be sure that even if um, something gets wrong, you're gonna be tied to the tree and you're not gonna fall from 20 meter high. 
So this is one of the most important guidelines, tree climbing training material. Um, actually, in other places like in South America or in the mainland of Asia, uh, they go higher than 20 meters. But in the Philippines so far, uh, we never needed to, to go higher than that. Um, I put this picture because it's, it's from another study than ours, but I think it is um, a really good way to explain how it works. Uh, you have to put your camera on another branch or on the trunk and you're facing a branch that could be a path. The distance between those two, between the branch and the camera, is really, really important because if you put it too close, you're going to have blurred pictures or only a part of the animal. So it's really technical and actually uh, a lot of mistakes at first. Uh, trying to understand how, how far it has to be and how we can put the camera to face the branch correctly. Um, in this kind of study, in arboreal camera trapping, uh, as much in ground-based camera trapping, you can choose to target uh, places, specific places. So you can choose to target some trees or not to target them. Uh, for example, here, in the study of Gregorian et al., uh, they have targeted um, trees that made uh, bridges over big, big roads in uh, South America. So it's up to you to choose to target trees on. What we have done in Palawan, so I just wanted for the people who don't really know um, well Palawan, we went to Puerto Princesa City and we did our study in the, the last barangay before uh, Roxas City. So the, the capital is here and it's a barangay quite far and very, very rural area. Uh, we thus climbed the trees in Langogan. Uh, we put the cameras between five and 20 meter high because sometimes five meters high is uh, um, good enough to get some uh, pictures of arboreal species. We used 20 cameras uh, over 15 locations and it actually has been a two years study uh, with camera checkup check every six weeks. Why two years study? Because uh, as I told you, we so much time you could place the camera in order to get the pictures. And we had to check up every six weeks because one of the major problems with uh, those kind of study is that you have a lot of leaves and all those leaves uh, can come in front of the cameras and trigger your camera and you can obtain like thousands of pictures of nothing. Uh, and the problem with this phenomenon is that the battery will empty uh, really quickly because it's taken pictures and pictures. Uh, with this checkup, every uh, actually we could manage the fact that sometimes we were missing data because when the, the cameras were triggered by leaves or a branch that was fallen, um, we we could uh, we would only miss like five weeks of um, of data. So it helped us lower the the loss of data. What did we get? Well, look, we had bear cats. Uh, so over the two years, we had a total of 2,900 night traps um, with a total, with all those um, trap nights of 73,000 pictures, which is huge. And as I told you, we had a lot, a lot of pictures of nothing, um, just leaves, branches, and sometimes insects. Um, we had actually 
over the um, among the 73,000 pictures, we had only 3,000 pictures of animals, which is still a lot, but it represents only 4.35% uh, of the pictures. Among those, we had 63 pictures of bintrungs, which is not much, but still way better than what I told you. We thus obtained a detection rate of 1.5%. 38%. Just a reminder, the mean detection rate uh, in ground-based camera trapping was 0.063%. So we doubled the detection rate, which is really great. Um, the other thing is uh, they did a study before uh, we came in uh, this area in Cleopatra's Needle Critical Habitat, and they had no bear cats. Um, while we had, so as I told you, the ground-based camera trapping, when you have no picture of bear cat, you can really not state that you have an absence of the animal. It's just that the method is really not well adapted to the to this species. We actually also detect other animals. Of course, we had five other mammals, including one endangered uh, species. We had pictures of pangolin, not much, but still some pictures of pangolin. And we had two net threatened species, uh, the flat, Palawan flooding squirrel. And also we had a lot of pictures of macaques. And what is interesting with this is that um, we, are not detecting only mammals, but we are also detecting a lot of birds. We had four, uh, 14 species of birds, which is really important in Palawan because, and in the Philippines in general, because I think you all know that there are a lot of endemic uh, bird species there. Uh, we had then two vulnerable species, the Palawan Almbill and the Great Slaty Woodpecker, uh, two net threatened species, the Palawan Blue Flycatcher, the spot throated flame back. And I think that as a conclusion for our first um, study, um, what is really important to, to understand is that this arboreal camera trapping helped us detect the burkat, but it also helped uh, detecting all the animals that are usually not detected by ground-based camera trapping. I'm not saying that the arboreal camera trapping is better than the ground-based camera trapping. I'm just saying that if you want to study arboreal animals, I really think to go for arboreal camera trapping because you're going to get way more uh, than with the ground-based camera trapping with studies that are not that expensive and that are not asking for that much effort. And now we are going forward with this uh, arboreal camera trapping. Uh, we have a new protocol that we started in March 2020. Unfortunately, it was a little bit uh, slowed down by the coronavirus crisis, but we're still uh, on it, uh, especially if uh, thanks to our to the partnerships we had with other organizations and uh, here I want to say a very very big thank to Catala Foundation that helped us a lot uh, with this uh, new protocol. Uh, in this protocol we set up 30 camera trap stations uh, that we leave for 45 days. Uh, we finally found uh, with this arboreal camera trapping in 45 days. 45 days was enough to get the first pictures of the bear cats. Um, we also decided, thanks to Catala Foundation, to pair cameras. So we have cameras, um, we have arboreal cameras, and we also put in some stations uh, cameras, as you can see here. Um, that way you can have a rigorous and precise uh, comparison uh, between arboreal camera traps and ground-based camera traps in terms of detection of species. And one of the reasons why we choose the 45 days 
is that it allows us to move this protocol and it allows us to go over different areas. So we choose six areas in the north of Palawan. And the idea is at the end to compare those areas and to do, um, I don't, we, we cannot do occupancy really because uh, as we don't know the home range of the Palawan Bearcat, it's too complicated to space the cameras and the, the forest uh, in Palawan are big, but not big enough uh, to, to space the cameras uh, of two kilometers or so. Uh, so we choose to space them for 500 meters, which is a little bit more than the, um, you remember, the mean uh, daily movement of the bear cats. Uh, so it, it allows us to have kind of an independency between the camera stations when it comes for the, to the bear cat. And the idea is still to compare those six areas and to have also uh, a comparison in between the areas to try to understand what part of the forest, what kind of the forest, what kind of trees uh, might attract bear cats more. Uh, so as I was just saying, um, this protocol will help us having more data about the ecology of the bear cat and the use of the forest. And then we are launching radio tracking. Actually, radio tracking is just currently uh, on, on, the, on the track. Uh, Jib and Princess, our two employees, are currently on the field trying to trap a bear cat to put the collar. Um, so for now, I have no results to, to show you, but I'll, I'll still uh, try to explain the, um, the goals and the protocols that we choose to, to implement. So what are we looking for with radio tracking? Uh, camera trapping help us understanding the, um, the use of the forest, but radio tracking help us getting in more details about it. Uh, we really want to know the influence of the bear cat conservation on the forest. What do I mean with this sentence? I mean that if ever we set a very precise conservation program on the bear cat, if ever we are talking about reintroduction of those animals in Palawan forest, we really need to know what would be the impact of it on the forest. For example, I've told you that we don't know what kind of animal can be eaten by the bear cat. Imagine that the bear cat eats a very specific mice that is endangered. What would be the impact of the conservation of the bear cat? What would be the impact of um, the reintroduction of the bear cats on those animals? It's really important to understand what is the ecological, what is the place of the bear cat in the ecosystem. But the way around is also very important. What is the influence of the forest conservation on the bear cat? Uh, what I mean by this um, sentence is kind of, it, it's not really the opposite. It's more like, imagine that the bear cat needs um, baliti trees, which is uh, a fig trees, um, to nest. Imagine that they cannot give birth in Palawan in other trees. Imagine that the, this tree, for reason or for another, sick or is destructed by human activity. Uh, finally, the efforts of conservation will be um, better and will be more efficient if it's uh, put in the conservation of those trees instead of trying to reintroduce back at that will not be able to reproduce because there, this tree is not present. So it's really important also to understand how we can act on the forest, on the tree species especially, um, to help the bear cat population stop decreasing and to help the stabilize or even like grow up. More specifically, we are looking for the identification of the three species of importance. 
as I told you, the three things that are important is the feeding, the resting, the nesting, which trees does and plants in more general way does the bear cat use. Uh, we need also an accurate characterization of the diets uh, in a qualitative and quantitative way of thinking. Uh, because as I told you, if it's eating a species, we need to know which species, we need to know how many uh, individuals of these species are eaten by a bear cat like in a year to understand the impacts of the bear cat, not only which species, but really the quantity of it. We also need to understand and to know about the home range of the bear cats because we need to understand and we need to know how many bear cats can live in each patch of forest uh, because once again there is no interest in going for reintroduction of animals if you don't know if uh, there are already maybe too many animals for the space that they have. And we have to evaluate the impact of the bear cat diets. In this, I mean, uh, we need more seed germination trial because those that have been done so far, so only two, uh, they, are, they came up with opposite results. And we really want to understand how the bear cat can help the forest uh, reg regeneration. And if they are helping specific trees also, uh, which might be uh, endangered or vulnerable. Radio tracking, because I'm talking a lot about radio tracking uh, for a while now, and maybe not all of you know about it. Um, it's a collar that you put on the animal that has GPS and or VHF device. The GPS is like the GPS on your phone and the VHF is more like uh, radio waves that you can use with an antenna to go and find the animal in the forest and follow it. The color size is really important. Usually it's maximum 8% of the weight of the animal, otherwise it can uh, be detrimental for the animal, which has a big, big um, consequence on the battery management uh, because the smallest the battery is and the, the, the quicker it will empty. You can thus get in general information with the GPS of the places where the bear cat goes and also information if you can go and follow the animal. So what we are doing, uh, actually it was a test in a, a rescue center of Palawan. Uh, we are going in Korong Korong now so as I told you, Jib and Princess are actually there to try to trap a bear cat. We are starting with only one animal because uh, it's all already taking a lot of resources, especially people uh, have to be there um, like almost seven days a week uh, to follow the animal. We choose to only do six months of study uh, because of the size of the bear cats that are quite small in Palawan and that um, prevent us to take a bigger color, so a bigger battery. So we only have six months of, um, of battery. Uh, we'll do day and night observations uh, because as I've told you before, bintrons are active by night mostly, but also by day. And we will use the GPS data to try to identify specific places, whether the bear cat goes often or the bear cat stays long, because those places have, are of importance uh, for the species. So the idea is to go there and try to find the trees where the bear cat were and what use uh, did they do? Was that feeding places, resting places? And the radio tracking will also uh, allow us to do feces analysis. So feces analysis is really important to have a better idea and uh, an accurate, accurate idea of um, what the bear cat eats, especially when it comes to um, things that the bear cat might eat really rarely, um, especially like animals, because it has never been seen um, during behavioral observation, but it might happen still. So we'll do lab analysis, which means direct observation 
of the feces. Is there any seeds, which seeds, uh, identification of the trees uh, that the seeds are coming from, uh, identification of bones, if there are any, of hair. We are also willing to do DNA barcoding, which uh, is a more precise analysis of the feces, uh, which helps to, uh, to get an idea, precise idea of what is there and also uh, the proportion of uh, those. And we might also go for parasites, which has no thing to do with the diet, but is still important because the, in, the ex situ studies showed that there are zoonoses that can be um, held by the bear cats and parasites are some of them. So it's still important, especially now the bear cats and the human are getting closer and closer to know uh, if there are any uh, disease that can spread from the bear cat to the humans. Uh, we will do germination trials. We will do ex situ germination trials, but also in situ with a direct observation of the feces. A princess who is um, a student working for AB conservation is really willing to um, uh, put cameras, time-lapse cameras there to see uh, the feces to um, see if there is germination of the feces once you leave them on site and also to understand the factors that can influence uh, the germination or the, the change in the feces. So I'm almost done. I'm sorry I, I talk too much when it comes to being strong. So our team, Pauline, the founder of the NGO and me, but we are now in France because of the health situation. Jib and Princess are our two employees that are going on the field right now. And of course, our guides, I cannot cite all of them because it depends on the place we go, but uh, we are really thankful and grateful to, to them, to helping them guiding us in the forest. Uh, as a conclusion, I hope I've convinced you that it is really, really important to go for more study about the bear cats in Palawan, but in the whole world in general, because we miss so many information and it might be such an important uh, species for the forest. So here it's the motto of the organization, study first raise awareness among local population, but also in the Western world, because I know that we are doing so many things that have an influence um, in Asia, and then protect the animal once you get the best way to conserve uh, the area, to conserve the, the species that are uh, linked to, to the bear cats. So, maraming salamat salaat uh, for listening to me. Maraming salamat again for um, UPLB for having me and I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any question, I'm here. Thank you, Agatha, for that uh, very wonderful presentation. Nice slides. Very simple, but very effective. Um, it's very clear. And um, I'm really happy that uh, you've already shown uh, several results on, the, on your studies on the Bing Turong. Uh, despite that you have only started, your group only started in 2017 in Palawan. Um, so we'll proceed to the question and answer uh, to the open forum. Uh, we have a question from Professor Judy Lundi Maldibot. Uh, she, she asked your forgiveness because she cannot uh, 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 turn on her audio because uh, it was, uh, she's now in Palawan and she's, uh, her audio is bad, but mm -hmm. uh, She's asking, um, what is the difference? Uh, what is the distance from uh, from one camera trap to the next one? Well, in our first studies, we didn't really uh, look after that because what we wanted was more about understanding how uh, we can place the cameras. Actually, in the first studies, we even targeted only fig trees. Uh, all our cameras were in baliti trees because we really wanted to 
understand if the arboreal camera trapping was effective. So in the first study, it was like sometimes five, um, 50 uh, meters, sometimes 100, but really close to each other. But in the study that we are implementing now, uh, it is at least uh, 500 meters. It can be more, but it is a minimum that uh, we want to keep uh, in order to have, as I told you, a kind of independence. It's not enough. I know it should be more uh, to make occupancy, especially, but it was too complicated to, to go for it in Palawan. All right. Um, there's a question. I think uh, Aaron James Ortega is asking, uh, Aaron, can you can you raise your question? Aaron. Um, yes. Yes, but um, when then was uh, to my in my question, do they have mating seasons, and do you observe something similar behaviors like that, like breeding seasons? Because I think it would be more easier to spot them if they would be traveling to the canopy to search for mates. Have you observed behaviors like that? Thank you. In Dipa, um, the breeding season is one of the controversial um, information because in the zoos, uh, they haven't really a breeding seasons, but it's in zoos. So, and it's in zoos in Europe, it's in zoos in and as we know, like it's really cold right now, which is not the case in uh, most of Southeast Asia. So the, the weather can really influence this kind of behavior. Um, so we don't really have the information yet about the breeding season. And it's one of the things we are looking for. It's not one of our main goal uh, with the radio tracking, but it's still one of the things. We want to know more about the interaction uh, between the animals and uh, try to understand if there is a breeding season in Southeast Asia of if, or if there is no, no not there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, may I call on Von Philip Perez uh, to raise your question, Von Philip? Juan Philip, you're raising your hand. Okay, probably we'll just proceed to the next question. I think can I call on Des Fernandez? She Des. Hi you guys. Hi Des. Mabuti. Okay, na man. So um, I think most of our audience are students. So what mm -hmm. can students and uh, the general public do to be more involved in binturong conservation? Well, very good question. First of all, we are really willing to have more students involved uh, in the studies. We are willing to have more students um, going on the field with us um, and going for, um, I don't know how it's called in UPLB, but uh, I think you have like a thesis at the end of the study to do. So um, now we have the radio tracking on tracks and it's ongoing. We will be very happy to have some students of UPLB coming with us. Um, the other thing, of course, that students can do, but like everybody can do is talking about the bear cats. Uh, because even in Palawan, sometimes uh, when we go uh, meet the locals, uh, either they are really confused, as I told you, between musang and uh, bintrongs. And when I, I say, oh, I want to see bintrongs, they, they are taking me to musangs. So um, it's not um, clear enough in the head of everybody uh, what's the difference between the, the civets and the bear cat. And I think also we all have a, a role to play uh, when it comes to the pet market. Because even in Palawan, um, so we, we are there for four, four years now. And uh, we've seen at least five bintrongs getting caught by local people to be sell on the pet market especially. So it is something that really everybody has um, something to do about uh, saying those are no pets. Uh, they really belongs to the forest and stop catching them. Thank you, Agas. 
Thank you, Thank you Des. Uh, Mam Jude has a follow-up question. She is asking if there are any plans of doing the Binturong research in Southern Palawan. Uh, we have plans. Uh, it was a, a bit difficult uh, at the beginning because um, uh, I don't know if you know about it, but uh, foreigners are not very welcome in the south of Palawan. It's really complicated when it comes to insurances because of um, the terrorist threats and because there were some kidnapping before there. So um, now we have um, Filipinos uh, working for for the NGO uh, and they are coming from south of Palawan. They are really willing to extend the, the project to south of Palawan. So I really hope that in the coming years, we'll be able to go to Abaldon, for example, and uh, other places south. So Aaron James Ortega, yeah, he also has a follow-up question, Aaron. Yes, uh, thank you for entertaining my questions. Also, sure. since we have footage of these binturongs, have you seen or observed hunting methods? Like, do they stalk pound skill or do they are they am ambush hunters um, or any notable hunting strategies they do in the wild? Actually, we haven't directly seen it. Uh, I've seen some traps in the in the forest, but it was mostly for uh, uh, white pigs. Um, but uh, when I was walking in Langogan, um, one of the people there they caught a bear cat. Actually, it was really simple. They put a trap with bananas, and you know that that kind of trap that can close once the animal is inside. And they they had a bear cat in like few few days so i think that bear cats are not that complicated to to poach either with traps or also they are not that shy uh, it was not described in palawan specifically but uh, there are some um, papers stating that the the hunt, the hunters that are used to poach bear cats are saying that they can shoot at them several times before the bear cat moves like the bear cats are quite uh, lazy, <laughs> mm -hmm. and even if they hear uh, very loud sounds, if they are eating, they will. It will take time before they say, "Okay, maybe it's dangerous. I have to go away." So poachers usually say that it's really easy to poach bear cats. Uh, thank you for your answer. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, we have Von Philip Perez to ask uh, Agatha. Von Philip. I think you're on mute. Yeah. You're on mute. Okay, while, while Aaron is, I'm uh, oh, sorry, Philip, all right. So, well, he's, Hello, all right, okay. We can hear you. I think there is no audio there. Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. We can hear you. I think there's a problem. Anyway, yes. uh, Von Philip Perez is asking how to protect the bear cats in our in our country. My maybe is just some. Um, you know, what are your recommendations uh, on bear cat protection? Well, first of all, as I told uh, before, as I said before, it's um, about raising awareness. So um, don't hesitate to to speak uh, about it. To say that they they have th there are uh, very strong uh, protection laws in the Philippines about uh, the wildlife. Uh, so. Um, those laws has to be remind to to everybody. Um, going for more uh, protected areas also way to protect not only the bear cat but all the animals there. Uh, I've seen that um, there are there are people also working in um, 
in Palawan here listening to me uh, and especially the, the Center for Sustainability uh, has worked a lot to have new um, protected area in Palawan and I think it's a very, very good and effective way to protect the bear cat. Um, as I said in my presentation, all the other things that have to be done that might be done. Uh, that we need more information. We need more study on the bear cat before going forward on those, because it would be very um, expensive uh, to go for breeding programs, to go for reintroduction programs, to do with to go with protect uh, very specific protecting and conservation programs. While it might be very, th th there might be very more effective and simple ways to protect the bear cat in protecting uh, target trees. So um, for now, I would say that a protected area and raising awareness are the two most effective way to protect the bear cat. Well, I, I have a question, Agatha. Yes, in terms sure. of costing, in, in, in terms yeah. of costing, <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think we have to know, um, uh, which is more cost costlier, um, the ground versus the arboreal versus the radio tracking and versus other high tech uh, other, um, well, high tech surveillance surveillance <laughs> uh, techniques. I guess it depends on your goals. Uh, a caller, the radio caller, is really really expensive, uh, especially since as a small so it needs specific colors smaller colors are i don't know why more expensive than bigger colors yeah. um and also because uh, as it's small we can only use it for six months but you cannot get that many information with only one bear cat and only six months especially because we talked about it uh, the seasonal effect uh, the seasons of effects on the, the behavior of the bear cat. So six months, it's not enough. We need at least one um, one full year of observation. So yes, the material of the radio tracking is uh, really the most expensive. And um, the, how, how can I say it? But the human effort also, because for the radio tracking, we need people uh, in the field uh, almost all the time. So, of course, those people have to be paid and we want mm -hmm. to pay them well. So it's way more expensive than the, the camera trapping because the camera trapping, even if you buy a lot of cameras, uh, you only need like one week uh, of work to set the cameras and one week of work to get the cameras back, especially with our uh, latest protocol. So it's way less expensive to than having like people on field for six months. Have you had uh, an experience where you lost your equipment? Uh, cameras, we had one camera uh, stolen from us uh, in an area with deforestation. Actually, I think that some um, tree poachers uh, that came there to cut the trees also take the camera because they were afraid of being recognized. <laughs> um, because on, on the other hand, we had cameras close by a river and we have a lot of people swimming in the river, but mm -hmm. they, did install the camera. So I really think it has a link with the uh, illegal activity there. So it's, uh, they're, they're kind of, you know, scared that they're being, being they are being monitored yes. by someone by, or, or by an institution. Yes, yes, I think so. And we also lost cameras because of humidity, because it's really what climate in the I Philippines see. and the and the digital uh, equipment usually don't really uh, get well with that kind of um, weather. Okay, uh, Mam Jude is asking, what about uh, have you used GPS collars? GPS collars. Uh, the collar that we different from the radio. It's the, it's, uh, the color that we're using has VHF and GPS. It has both of the devices. Mm -hmm. So yes, we are gonna use it. Uh, as I said, we are ongoing with the cameras, with the radio tracking. So um, our team is actually in El Nido. And I think, uh, what time is it in the Philippines? It's four it's now. 4.20. So, yeah, I think they have uh, set up the trap for the bear cats. And I really hope that 
we catch the bear cat in the in the coming weeks. Uh, but yes, the color that we're using has GPS and VHF because it gives very different information. The GPS will allow us to get the home range to the daily, the 24 hours uh, movements, uh, and also to get uh, specific places where the bear cat stays long. Because even if you do the daily observations, sometimes you can miss that kind of information because we cannot have people like looking at the bear cat 24 hours a day. It's too, <laughs> too tiring and too, too tiring. complicated. So they have, to, they have to relax sometimes while the GPS doesn't need a uh, day off. So yes, yes, we have GPS also. Uh, Mam Judy is also asking um, if, if she has students uh, who would be interested in doing studies on the bear cat. Uh, can she collaborate with you? Can they collaborate For with sure. you? Of course, um, they hope they are hoping that uh, they will be allowed to go on field work uh, next year. Yes, I'm hoping to. And as I said to Desamari, uh, we are really willing to to have students involved and also to to have stronger partnership with the UPLB. So feel free to contact me. Um, I don't know if we can send my email or something. I can send your something. email yep. address uh, when I contact the participants for when we upload the YouTube uh, YouTube Perfect. Uh, video. Okay. So you'll have my, my contact and feel free to, to contact me for any study uh, about the bear cat in Palawan. I'll be very likely and um, glad to help. Okay. Uh, Aaron is already asking another question. Aaron? Yes. Very I'm very sorry. Okay. It's okay. Your That's good. Um, I've read that they use scent and claw marks as some form of territorial markers. Do you consider that when you're choosing trees for arboreal setups? Um, do I consider the, the markers? Is that the question, right? Yes, if you consider it in choosing what tree to set up the cameras or for okay. arboreal cameras? Um, for the first study, we target really uh, fruiting tr trees uh, because uh, we really thought that it was the, the better way to get image, to get footages of the bear cat. For the second um, uh, study that we are doing on, in camera trapping, uh, we really wanted to to have several trees uh, because sometimes when you're targeting trees, you're also uh, forgetting about some trees that might be interesting, but you don't think about them. So with that study now, we are really willing to, to test a lot of different trees without having any um, uh, ideas of if it's gonna work or if it's not gonna work, if we gonna detect more bear cats there or not. And we'll see with the pictures if there is any tree uh, that are more likely to be visited by the bear cats or not. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you, Aaron. Thank uh, you. One last question uh, from, from Camila Meneses, all the way from KU. <laughs> Cam. Hey, I guess, uh, hey. Uh, I have a, a question about the, the technicalities of the camera trapping, mm -hmm. because you mentioned a while ago that uh, in six weeks you keep coming back uh, to observe what, what photos are there or, or what. So uh, my question there is in six, in six weeks, how, how do you account for the camera trapping bias of counting each individual since you, you mentioned to us the, the mean percentage of increase for the use of arboreal camera trapping compared to the uh, ground camera trapping. Well, th this is also one of the reasons why we wanted in our new study to have paired cameras uh, okay. to, to get rid of that bias. And um, the, the, the main problem with our first study is that some of the station um, were used for so long why were switched uh, either because the branches uh, 
fell down uh, or because we really noticed that it was not working because we didn't place the camera well. And sometimes when you target trees, you think it will work, but finally it's too close. The biggest problem that you have in trees or in the top of the trees that you don't have down uh, is that you cannot really choose where you put your cameras because the branches are the branches and you cannot move the branches. Um, while ground, uh, on the ground, you can always like put um, some sticks, you can have something to help you put the camera. And uh, I think we have biases uh, in our first study. So it's encouraging um, um, results, uh, but we cannot go that much forward and say that the, the arboreal camera trapping is that the best way to study the bear cat. And that's really why we, within this new study, we want to get rid of those biases. Uh, in 45 days, we have nobody going to the cameras anymore. So um, it, it's really like all the same and standardized protocol. Thank you. OK. Thank you very much. That will be our last question for this webinar. And uh, thank you, Agatha, for you know um, being with us right now. Thank you for having me. OK. Uh, may I call on our director, Sir JC Gonzalez, to uh, give a short uh, closing while we prepare our virtual certificate of recognition. Sir JC? Sir JC? Thank you, Floor. Hi, good afternoon. Um, good afternoon, um, sir. Good uh, afternoon, Paul. Uh, a very splendid talk. It was very entertaining and, and very much, uh, it's very informative as well because uh, uh, the museum actually has done um, a project on forest canopy. Well, we called it forest canopy, but it, it, we tried to look into um, uh, the biodiversity around the upper layers of our forest here in Mount Makiling. So it's kind of like a it's kind of weird because we call it preliminary study at some point because we realized that in the Philippines, not much studies have been done on, on um, the, the, the biodiversity above the layers, beyond the, 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 uh, the understory. Everybody just does all the groundwork, but no, everybody looks up. But actually being up there at the top of the canopy using a harness has a different perspective. Of course, you observe a lot more things. So we tried, we used a lot of cameras, but <laughs> not very successful with what we wanted to do. We did get enough data to, to show that there is a difference of, of diversity, especially between vertebrates across uh, uh, the different um, layers. So yeah, we, we have the, the museum is lucky enough to have some sort of early um, equipment, particularly the, the, uh, the climbing equipment, the cameras, so we can start doing further studies in the kind of, especially with mammals, um, that would be very much interesting. Um, so yeah, um, hopefully uh, the museum and its staff would continue to do uh, uh, studies in the canopy. Um, my question, actually, I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> they want to join in a long series of questions. I was just interested because there's a lot of, um, there's been a lot of uh, studies using camera trapping in Palawan. Um, it's quite unusual because the camera trapping I knew was like used almost 20 years ago. Uh, for Lilio, we started doing that with uh, the fruit eating um, monitor lizard. So we're able to know that they were feeding on pandanus. Uh, but here it's like this multitude There's one done by Center for Sustainability. One of my, when one of my students now who's doing her MS here is, uh, did that with, uh, uh, on, but they did mostly groundwork in I think Cleopatra's needle. Uh, my question would be, uh, Protect Wildlife has been involved in Palawan for like three years, four years now. And they did a lot of, research on biodiversity towards the use of camera trapping. So where was your uh, uh, organization involved, especially with say training or support from Protect Wildlife? No, we, we have very good relationship with them, but they are, are currently more focused on the pangolin. Uh -huh. uh, so, and they are working also a lot with Catala Foundation. So, we are in relation with them, but they are working in different areas than we do currently. So we are more working with Catala Foundation because we we finally had um, common 
um, how can I say that common targets because with the with this arboreal camera trapping we were able to have pangolins so they were inter interesting also in uh, knowing if they can see more pangolin than they thought uh, in the in the upper canopy and also because uh, Catala is working in so many species yeah they were also working on the hornbills they, they they're working on so many species that they were interesting interested in having um, both of the the protocols ground-based cameras and also arboreal cameras so we trained uh, their team uh, with the tree climbing and uh, we helped them uh, uh, installing camera traps in uh, in uh, two of the reserves they are managing right now. So yeah, it's it's really important for us to work with uh, with all the foundations and uh, all the organizations there. Yeah, I was just interested because uh, uh, the bear well the bear cat is one of the again one of the most uh, part of what the wildlife that's being trafficked in the Philippines and, and wildlife tracking is one of the major goals of Project Wildlife. So it's like putting those two together so there should be some connection somewhere. But yeah. <laughs> they are, they are. But actually, we were also very <laughs> slowed down by the, the health crisis uh, because um, I was working uh, with in improving our relationship with all the organization why I was forced to go back to France. So uh, it, it didn't help, uh, I say, uh, to, to improve our relations with the Project Wildlife. But what they've said so far is that they were really more focused on the, the, Palawa, the Palawan pangolin, actually, because they, they are really at stake right now. And there, there is so much. Uh, yeah, illegal poaching and everything about the pangolin much more than on the bear cat. So I also understand that it is uh, one of the priority right now. Thank you. So yeah, spend it work at them again. Allowing... And also to react what, uh, to what she said, you said that in the Philippines, uh, there were not much um, study about the canopy, but actually I think it's all over the world. We have underestimated what's happening in the upper layers of the forest. We were so focused on what we can see, the ground-based uh, things and ground-based animals that we just forgot about looking up. Yeah, it's a matter of just, actually we have um, three, two, two towers built up here in Makiling. So hopefully that will be used for, for further studies and kind of thing. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually acrophobic, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so again, I'll, um, um, in recognition of your um, uh, contribution, so we'll have a certificate of recognition uh, to, uh, I hope I pronounce it again correctly, Agathe de Bril. Yes. Actually, uh, you Filipinos uh, pronounce it better than French people, so don't be afraid of it. So, <laughs> uh, for serving resource person during our uh, 2021 um, MNH Biodiversity Seminar Series with the uh, talk, uh, the Bearcat Study Program and how to study the elusive Palawan Bearcat held here on 9th of February 2021, uh, of course, by Zoom. and. Um, Signed there off, uh, yours truly, and of course, take a floor for facilitating uh, our BSS. Uh, and again, thank you very much for that splendid talk. Thank, thank you, sir you. Daisy. Thank you, sir Daisy. So uh, we're out of time now, right now. And um, please uh, make sure that you answer our online evaluation form. Uh, I've already posted the link at the chat box or you could actually, if you are able to memorize this bit.ly link, it's just bit.ly slash 2021-bss-eval. We will be accepting responses only until 9 p.m. today, Philippine time. So we invite you to um, go to our website if you want to know more about the Museum of Natural History. Uh, go to mnh.uplb.edu.page and if you want to ask uh, some questions, uh, feel free to drop us an email. Of course, we are inviting you to like, subscribe, or follow everything in social media. So we are on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. You can also find us in Wikipedia and TripAdvisor. <laughs> we are everywhere. And <laughs> we are everywhere except in France. <laughs> but, but, um, 
we will be uploading the recording of this webinar in our YouTube channel probably uh, later tonight or earlier tomorrow. So just go to youtube.com slash UPLB Museum. And before I end our webinar, I would like to personally thank Agatha uh, for spending time with us. And I'm sure that uh, we, when this pandemic is all over, you can go back to the Philippines and continue on working on the Paracat. I really program. hope so. <laughs> I miss it actually. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Agatha. Maraming Thank you. Salamat. Thank you very much for having me today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, one, for uh, participating. We still have two more uh, seminars um, upcoming this week. Uh, it's tomorrow and on Thursday. So just check our Facebook uh, for the links to the registration pages. We hope to see you tomorrow and on. Thursday. Maraming salamat. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye, Agatha. Bye, sir. Bye. Thank Bye, you. Bye, everyone. Again.